Good afternoon, Web Summit. I want to grab your attention for a second and ask a question. Uh, who amongst the audience knows about the Humane Pin? No one? The Humane Pin? Wow. We are we're talking, going to talk about AI, but uh, very few people know about Humane Pin. I mean, that, that kind of shows that it wasn't really an inspirational product. Uh, I want to get your thoughts on they marketed a lot in terms of being an inspirational product, but how do you even be inspirational without failing? Tie in those thoughts about Humane Pin and building an inspirational AI product. Sachin? So look, I think um, you know, what's really important is to just get a level set for just where we are uh, from a, a life, sort of timeline perspective. You know, it's kind of like the day after AOL launched the disk. And then everyone said, oh my god, the internet was born yesterday. But it wasn't really. The internet had been here for many, many years before. And language models, transform models had been here for over a decade. Um, what we're really seeing now is the first real use cases. And I think for me, in my own experience, what's been the most inspiring is the first use of AI, which is the ability to go from idea to execution without becoming a subject matter expert. Whether you want to make a song that we were sort of discussing earlier on, you want to make an application, you want to write a unique piece of content, you're no longer limited by your ability to use a tool set. Um, and really what that means um, is that we've gone from complex user interfaces to something that looks like WhatsApp to control the most complex software on the planet. And that's just so inspiring in itself. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I, I would completely agree with you. you know, the best technology products, when they move uh, from being efficient to being inspirational, are the ones where the technology actually goes into the background, right? And enables, with a simple hook, kind of very complex and advanced human ambition, right? So think about you know, whether it's Deliveroo or it's Uber, it's a one click, right? When I was at Dropbox, we used to talk a lot about how efficient the product was. And I used to always wonder, hey, why do we still exist? Why do users still love us 10, 12, 15 years after some of the biggest competition any other you know, independent company has faced from Apple, Microsoft, Google? And it's really because the product was so simple. There was one unit of value, and the product reflected each individual user. So your Dropbox and how you organize all your most important digital things looked a lot different than mine. And I think that's what we're seeing again with AI. A very simple user interfaces, but allow you to scale your ambition. If you're a marketer and you're at a Fortune 500 company and you're using Jasper, you used to write maybe two marketing pieces a week and really struggle with that. Yeah. Now you can use Jasper and you can create 2,000 in a week. And really, your ambition can go from working on a product that you market in a geo to marketing hundreds of products globally. And I, and I wanted to add to that, you know, I had a really interesting conversation yesterday at, in, in Web Summit in Doha. You know, there's a lady that came to us and she said, um, I run a nonprofit for people with Alzheimer's. And I want to build an application that allows people to be able to diagnose better, measure better, and get expert help. This is someone that is running a nonprofit for Alzheimer's, somebody who would never create software before. And so suddenly, using AI, you're giving them the ability to do what they couldn't do. And I think that is just, that's really inspiring. We talked about efficiency in general. But efficiency also means becoming a bit boring, in, in a way. Uh, ChatGPT right now is an aspirational product or inspirational product for a lot of people. But it was a research project. It was released as a research project. Uh, how do you become, can you engineer simple products into becoming inspirational? So look, I think, you know, we at least have a philosophy that non-subject matter experts in anything, music, content, software, they really have two fears. It's the fear of irrelevance that gets them to want to do something. It's the fear of failure that stops them. And, and you know, how do you keep someone away from both those fears? You keep them excited. Right? You deliver magic. I think what we're seeing for the first time is en masse across music, film, graphics, content, software, legal, we're, we're delivering magic really fast. And that magic gives people the energy to keep going. 
right, to the next point of magic, to the next point of delight. And that's just so powerful. But, but do, do, Tim, do you really think it's magic or it's efficiently engineering or repeating tasks very quickly? I mean, I, I think speed and efficiency are just table stakes, you know, to be honest. I think what most organizations want is they want a strategic advantage, right? They want to understand how do we take our distinct knowledge and insights and values about our products, our customers, our markets, and bring those to bear, right? And I think in, in that sense, you want to think about how do I make each employee more powerful, right? More capable. And you know, the reality is when you look at large organizations in particular, and you actually go sit with a, you know, an end level employee, a frontline employee, it's a very lonely job for most of them. And they've spent a couple decades looking at you know, a blink, blinking cursor on a page. And so now they have the ability to have essentially superpowers, right? They have the ability to reduce the friction of getting started. They have a brainstorming partner. They can ideate much faster. If I'm writing a piece of content, I can have AI write me 100 versions of that. And now I can be the editor, right? So now I'm automatically upskilling. And I'm able to deliver a lot more value back to the business, which then makes me more valuable. Oh. I wanted to ask, like the other day we had the conversation about AI bringing a lot of value to us. And for that right now, the pitch of AI products or AI apps is that we'll collect a lot of data from you, you trust us, and you give us a lot of data and we provide some value out of it. Uh, what's the line, I would say, that there is to cross when it becomes too creepy or too invasive versus becoming efficient uh, in terms of gathering your data and giving value back to you? So, so look, I think you have to go a little bit, uh, take a step back and saying, where is the value actually coming? Right? And from my experience speaking to customers, and, and we have a number of customers in, in Qatar, is real value comes from two areas. Well, three. One is accelerate idea to MVP uh, or, or execution. But really, it's remove human variability and offload some of my tasks. And the question really is, is how much do I need that's unique to me to be able to achieve that? That doesn't exist in the general status of the data, right? in the general status of the language model, in the general sort of ether. And, and I think you have to do the minimum amount needed to be smart enough that it's delivering delight to the customer without asking them to give you the bank account, their wallet, and all of their personal messages. And so you're starting to see companies really tread that very important line between too much, um, where actually, from a loss of diminishing return, you don't really get a lot of additional benefit. Mm -hmm. Tim, what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think for us, we mainly deal with large enterprises, right? And so the value that they're going to get in reshaping their business around this new infrastructure called AI is leveraging probably their last 10 to 15 years in big data, right? That is the real key asset. When I think about building AI products, the model is not the product. Exactly. The context is the product, right? You know, all the unique business logic, uh, the unique data that you have, the insights that you have, how you process those and get the model to think in the language of your business is where there's an incredible amount of value. So for us, I, I think it's less about encroachment and it's more about how do companies leverage the data that they have? How do they enable employees to do that in a responsible manner? And then how do they do that in a secure way as they bring that data forward to customer experiences? Well, and I think there's a really interesting thing in that and something you just said, which is you know, we all have an artist problem that we think everything's unique. Yeah. But actually, when you look at a set of conversations, a set of behaviors, a set of calls to a call center, what you realize is only 2% is unique. 98% is a variation of the 2%. And so you're effectively seeing legification of everything. And actually, the only reason it can happen is because of the current state of AI. And, and like you, the points that you made is that the efficiency key, or, or rather the uniqueness that you're talking about, it comes from good design, in a way, because models are commoditized. More and more functions of what AI can do uh, is becoming more and more available to each and every developer. So how do you think about design in terms of developing a taste which stays in the mindset of users for the long time? All companies want to become a verb, like 
chat GPT, even even when people talk to chatbots, they they say that I'm talking to chat GPT, even if they're talking to Llama or they're talking to Claude or they're talking to in Google. How do you kind of inspire that design? Do you think that first mover advantage is necessary there, but or that you can disrupt the market or be get to people's mind share with good design and good taste? So look, I think I think owning the vernacular is always powerful. But no one owns search for a very long time, right? And it went through different iterations. So yes, being the first mover means you have you have first dibs on the vernacular. Doesn't mean you have long-term dibs on the vernacular. We've seen this with Yahoo, then it went to Google, and now you know it's a perplexity or a chat GPT or a Claude. I think what's really important is how do you deliver simplicity? And that comes down to an abstraction problem. And what do I mean by that? What's the atomic unit? Right? So for us, a builder, the atomic unit is the feature. Um, for others, the atomic unit is a legal construct or a content construct. Or you know, as Ed Sheeran once said, all songs can be done with four chords. Right? So, so the point is then, when I have that abstraction unit, which is really the hard work for your idea, how can I take lots of these abstraction units and put them together to create a unique experience? Yeah. I mean, I, I would say in the enterprise, I, I think we broadly as an industry are applying AI incorrectly. Um, I, think, I think we've applied it in the enterprise in a very consumer-like way, but it, it hasn't necessarily fulfilled what I think it can in terms of unlocking value. And what I mean by that is if you think about what AI is really great at versus humans, it's about looking at very large data sets and then finding unique insights and subtle patterns. And you know, what I think you know, you're going to start to see products, including Jasper and others, shift to is that instead of the employees and humans prompting AI, it's going to be the inverse. AI is actually going to prompt the humans. And that's what's going to drive that spark of inspiration. Right? In, a, in a marketing context, you know, it can look at all the marketing activities that are going on, everything that your competitors are doing, all of your SEO and then start to find pockets and say, hey, you haven't updated anything on the blog about this product in two months. Or hey, have you noticed that you have a particular new cohort of users in this geography or that are attached to a new persona? We don't market to that persona. Would you like me to help you start to market in that direction? So that's where I think the spark will come from. Because today, it's very easy to use AI, but you have to know how to use it. You have to come with an intended goal in mind. And I think very quickly, as companies kind of warm up their data and warm up the security around it, and then they process it with LLMs in agentic behavior, you're going to see the complete inverse. And that's when we're going to see the real power of AI reshape organizations. Yes, how you do you make humans superhumans? Yeah. And that's actually, that's, that's the real power of this. Mm -hmm. uh, how, do you, how do founders who are building an AI should think about building differentiation because models are changing very quickly. They have to, they can't stick to like a very linear and uh, I would say rigid tech, tech stack. When the models are coming in quick and fast, they have to plug in and change their product accordingly. How should they think about their strategy in building these products? So, so I think number one, building products in 2025 and 2026 is going to be like the most insanely easy experience compared to building it in 2020. Mm -hmm. uh, and a part of that, I think, is we've now seen this become, I call it infra infrastructurized. Right? It's now table stakes. Um, as you think about building the application layer, which to me is actually the higher value layer, you can almost think about the models or the foundational models as cloud plus plus. Um, and so really, it's about the application layer. Uh, and the application layer, it's, it's all about how do I deliver a simple experience, number one. But also, how am I not dependent on a single model? Because okay. you know, if you think about DeepSeek, for example, built on Llama, distilled with OpenAI. Right? And so you're seeing a really good example of you know, something that shook everyone for the last few weeks. Um, and it's actually multi-model. And so we're seeing mo more and more founders take this approach of saying, I will use multiple models to give me the right answer. I will cross-verify I'll check. And the IP now gets built to that layer above, orchestration plus plus versus just being focused on building foundation models. I, I want to ask a slightly different question to you. Because you're in marketing, there is going to be a lot of AI content slop. 
how do founders or how do companies come out of it and not be in pressure of okay despite using whatever tool the content they generate can be mediocre but how do they get out of the pressure of producing more and actually produce effective content i think it depends on what the strategy and the focus is you know we have most of our customers uh, one of their main goals is personalization right so uh, there's a major footwear brand uh, that we've written some case studies on uh, that's based in Europe and a lot of us are wearing their footwear and one of the things that they've wanted to do is personalize the photos on their product pages. So if you let's say have a brand new trail running shoe that's coming out, what they want to be able to do is when you go to that site to buy that product, the photo that you see is AI generated, right? But it's a composite of a trail runner, right? and it's on a trail that is very close to your house, right? So, you know, that's how they want to take, you know, from just having one stock photo to an infinite number, right? One to the end of customers, um, but they want to do it in a hyper-personalized way, right? And, and I think that's where, you know, it's not just about creating, you know, a quantity of content, it's really about quality, it's about personalization, and most even large organizations who have global ambitions have a very difficult time around scaling just base level content, right? Because it has to go out through multiple channels, in multiple geographies, in a lot of localized languages, and then you have variants that you're testing. So just to be able to do that all at the same time globally is a big challenge. When I was at Dropbox, we would launch first in North America. By the time it got to the Middle East, it was multiple quarters behind. And so while all the materials were finally translated, corporate office in San Francisco, we'd already moved on to the next thing. And so, you know, now you're, that same organization is able to roll out campaigns globally, all localized at scale. And I think, you know, those are some of the use cases that we see large marketing organizations, you know, really achieving and unlocking new value. It's all about, you know, what, what can we help them do that has, you know, in the, historically been impossible, yeah. right? It's not just more of the same. It's, hey, let's find those impossible problems like rolling out a global product and help you achieve that quickly. Now, we have 30 seconds left, so I want to ask a quick question to both of you. What's an inspirational product in current ways that you can think of and you can't take your own names com companies? Can you go first? Yeah. <laughs> uh, granola would be the first one. I think the second one is I really want a fusion of my calendar and AI. I think it's just a huge missed opportunity. It's something that we're working on for marketers at Jasper, but the AI should be proactive. It should look at my calendar and start creating content, start creating summaries ahead of the meeting. Uh, I think it's a, it's a huge vector of innovation. Yeah, you know, I, I'd say the same thing. We were discussing this. To me, the, the big on earth thing is how can I bring together email, notes, and my calendar so that I can stay current and not spend any time trying to catch up. Uh, and I think that's just so powerful, especially if you can then bring in public data, like what you posted or what you wrote about, because it makes me smart before the meeting. Awesome. Thanks a lot, folks, for uh, sticking around and talking, listening to our talk. Uh, that's it from us. Thank, Thank you. you.